I'm just looking forward to preaching and sharing the Word of God with you this morning. So if you would, stand with me. We're going to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 63 this morning. Psalm 63, one of my very favorite psalms. And um, I hope before the service is over, it will be one of your favorite psalms, and it will speak to your hearts as well. Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you, and my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. You ever felt like that? You just, it's like there's nothing in this world that can satisfy except for a fresh experience with the Lord. And that's, this is kind of where David is at here. And then he starts remembering. He says, I have seen you in your sanctuary. I've gazed upon your power and your glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Just a hard stop. You don't have to indicate or anything, but just have you this week lifted your hands in prayer before you came to church? Have you taken time to praise the Lord and worship the Lord by your bedside or in your chair that you have your coffee in in the morning or somewhere during the day to just lift your hands and worship the Lord? He says, you satisfy me more than the richest feast and I will praise you with songs of joy. That's what the courses were we were singing this morning. They're songs of joy and thanksgiving. He's proceeded through the day, and then he goes to his bed at night, and he says, I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Now, I can relate to that. There was never any girl that kept me awake at night until I started dating Becky. And when I started dating Becky, I would lay in bed at night just thinking about her and dreaming about her. As a matter of fact, Pastor Corey, I'm almost embarrassed to admit this, but I gave her a bottle of perfume. And before I gave it to her, I opened up the bottle and I put just a little touch of it on my pillow so when I went to bed at night, I could smell her, you know? And so I had to explain to her why the box was open. I didn't give her a used bottle of perfume, you know, but I, I wanted to, I just lay in bed thinking about her. My roommate, who's now the uh, assistant uh, district attorney for the state, for another state, he, um, he just teased me about that endlessly. He would tell Becky, he said, I smell you all the time. He just drenched his pillow. It wasn't true. I just put a dot on there. But I, I would lie awake thinking of her. And listen to what David says. God, I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Not watching Netflix, not watching Hulu, but thinking about the Lord. Because you are my helper. Look at this again. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely, but those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become the food of jackals. But the king will rejoice in God, and all who swear to tell the truth will praise him, praise God, because liars will be silenced. Father, in the next few minutes, we just ask you to speak to us richly and deeply from your word, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. I spent some time this week reading about, it's for something I'm working on for the future, so I just was looking up interviews of current and, at least in my lifetime, of popular artists and song artists and authors of songs. We had in our church in Georgia, we had a lady in our church who was, she made a wonderful living writing music. She wrote, for, wrote some of the biggest named songs in country and Western music. And a lot of country western stars recorded her music. If I was to call them out, I would tell you would recognize some of those songs. As a matter of fact, her swimming pool was in the shape of a large guitar that was the gift of a, of a country music star who's had a number of number one hits that she actually wrote for him. Wonderful lady, sweet lady, loved her very much. She's in heaven now, and, but she loved the Lord. And I just wanted to look at, because as you know, some songs are sad, some songs are joyful, some songs are happy. I Occasionally, I will sing a song that is sad because it helps me to express the grief that I have. When our first, when our second son's first child, when they lost that first child, I 
just had to look up songs that would help me pray so I could grieve. And, and I remember Rachel sent me a, a book she wanted me to read with her on lament, and we worked through that time together prayerfully. When Bear was born and I prayed a dedication prayer over Bear, we remembered that first child, and we all wept, but we also rejoiced because God had given them this beautiful little grandson of theirs. And so when you read this psalm and you first begin to read it, you hear twice songs of joy. But both of these songs, uh, references to the songs of joy, come out of a very desperate and difficult time in David's life. What you may not know from just reading this psalm and, is that David is fleeing from his life, not from the Amalekites, not from the Canaanites, David's fleeing from his life from his own son, Absalom. David is having to run for his life, and, and Absalom has usurped the throne. Absalom has done something so hideous that I won't even mention it from the pulpit this morning of what he had done, but it was so hideous that it was no turning back, so immoral there was no turning back, and he did it in the eyes of all of Jerusalem. And the sad thing was that people are attracted to power, people are attracted to authority, and most people are attracted to the crowd. That's what makes a mob so dangerous. That's what made some of what we went through in 2020 so dangerous in the United States was mob reactions and people responding before they got all of the facts, and they knew everything. David is running from his son, and he leaves Jerusalem fleeing for his life with a remnant, and that's important. He's, he leaves with a small group. He doesn't leave popular. He leaves with some people cursing him. He leaves with some people throwing rocks at him. He leaves with people who wanted to kill him and destroy him, and he leaves with this tiny group of loyal people who know the truth, and they follow him. It's always interesting to me how tempting it is for people to follow the crowd. It's why Jesus would say that narrow is the way to eternal life, but broad is the path to destruction. And so we, here we have David. He's in the wilderness. He's an older man. He's had to leave the comforts of the palace. He's not used to living in the field. And he's got this small band of people that tell him you have to keep moving because if Absalom catches you, he will kill you. And there in that wilderness, David kneels to pray, and he prays these words that so many people say, and it's wonderful that they say them or pray them, but maybe now I hope that you will have a fresher appreciation for them. And David points to four specific places we can find God. And first of all is in the wilderness. He says in verse 1, oh God, you are my God, and I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Now, it's interesting that David would pray this prayer because most of the time we expect God to show up on our timetable. I know I come confidently to church every week on Sunday mornings because the Lord has called us to gather and to assemble and to worship Him. We're obeying God by gathering in His presence. And I never take that for granted because I pray every Sunday for you and for me that the Lord will just manifest Himself in truth and wisdom and love and power to our lives. But then there are other times when we're in the wilderness. We've earned those dry places. We're in those thirsty places, and we discover that what's in the world doesn't satisfy us. What's in the world doesn't satisfy the longing of our souls. It, it's like we're dry, and we're parched, and we're dying. And we kind of keep hoping that God will show up. But sometimes God brings us to those desert places, those difficult places so that we will become accustomed again to earnestly seeking him, to going after him with all of our heart. You know, that's the reason that it's sometimes there I tell people when they tell me, say, Pastor, I just feel like God is so distant. As one man said to me one time, I feel like he's a thousand miles away when I'm praying. And I remind them of the truth of this. God is always with us. God is always present. He's always there but sometimes he lets us experience those dry places so we will go hard after God. 
Three weeks ago, I stood up here behind this pulpit and I told the first service and I told you in the second service as I watched people worship it was as though you were going hard after God you were seeking God you were seeking to glorify and to worship him I've tried to put my place in David's shoes but I can't simply just fit into his shoes because my life is different I've tried to imagine what it would be like for your son to betray you I've tried to imagine the pain that it would feel like it's not an enemy from outside your household, but it's your son that you love. It's your son that, you, that you've raised. It's your son that you rocked as a baby, that he's turned upon you, and what he wants for you is for you to be dead right now. He wants to destroy you because if he can destroy you, the kingdom is surely his. I've tried to imagine what kind of embarrassment it must have gone through David's mind. Because, you know, oftentimes, and... I know this because I've been a pastor for close to 50 years now, and I've had just about every imaginable conversation you can have of parents who've been embarrassed by their children's lifestyle choices, parents who've been embarrassed by what their children have done, parents who've said to me with tears, flowing, my children have told me they hate me, they never want to see me again. I've taken kids to the graves of their parents that they said those hateful things to after they've already died. And, and we've had these moments of prayer before the Lord, asking God to forgive them and to heal them and reminding them that their, their folks died in faith. And so here David is struggling, and I, I, I just simply could not do it. I tried to imagine that Andrew or Christopher or Benjamin or Amy wanted, turned against me and wanted me dead. But then I could go through my own dry places experiences, which I'm so thankful I don't have the kind of experience David has. But I could go through my own dry places where I remember where God, it felt like you were a thousand miles away. Times that I've come into this sanctuary and says, Lord, why for someone in the church or for the church or even in my own life? But then David takes us to this place and he reminds us of what he does when he's in that dry place. The second place, you can find God in the desert. And when you find God in the desert, it's a good thing to remember what God did in the sanctuary. For in verse 2, he says, I've seen you in your sanctuary, and I've gazed upon your power and your glory. I've seen you in your sanctuary. If there's anything I want for our children and our grandchildren... If there's anything I want for the generations that are growing up right now in our church, I want them to gaze upon the power and the glory of God here. I could care less whether or not they remember platform decorations, the color of the carpets. I could care less whether they remember me in years to come. But what I want them to remember is this, is that God was present when we gathered in this place. We gathered in his name. We gathered in his name to worship him. For Jesus said, where two or three or you are gathered together in my name, I am there in your presence. And that's what I want more than anything for the children. When they come into our nurseries, we call them, I believe, creepers and crawlers until they get to the cli Am I saying that right? Yes, no, I'm not. My wife's correcting me. They're not creepers and crawlers anymore. What are they? Just, I like the other better. So anyway, they're now they're just the babies in the nursery, but we used to call them creepers because they creeped around and not because they were creepy. They're your children. I would never call your children creepy, but they were crawlers and they were all over the place. And that's how we used to do it. And uh, anyhow, the, the babies, I want them to know the presence of God. It's why we didn't hire people to come in to take care of our nurseries, but we asked mothers and fathers to be a part of our nursery so that you could sing to them, you could pray with them, and they would remember you from their earliest days that you would be a part of their lives. I talked this morning to one of the women who, let, who was in the nursery and missed the first service because she was taking care of our children and our babies. And I, I admire the place that they hold in our community and where they serve in our community. But there she was, loving your children because I want them to remember the presence of God. I want them to remember the power and the glory of God as well, that God saved and that God healed and that God transformed lives. But there's something key that you need to look at here. He says it's your sanctuary. 
It wasn't too long after I became the pastor of this church a long time ago. And it was a beautiful sanctuary. I'm so thankful for what God has blessed us with. But somebody had done something here at the church, and it made somebody else angry. And they called me. I was actually out at a local restaurant with one of the families. We were new here. And um, I, just to be honest with you, I... I didn't really want to stay in Michigan. I was hoping God would just bring us here briefly and take us back south. And they called me in the wintertime. So don't ever call me with a complaint in the wintertime when there's ice and snow. Just don't do that. And so he called me up and says, well, I'm going down to the church and I am going to punch a hole in the sanctuary. If they're going to treat so, I'm going to punch a hole. And I just, I just like, really? And I looked and I said over the phone, I said, really, you're going to do something that stupid. If you do that, I'm going to see to it that you're kicked out of the church. Do you understand me? He goes, you would do that? I go, absolutely I would do that. And then I would patch the hole, and then I would go and hug your neck and tell you I love you, and that when you for, repent of your sin, I will ask the church to take you back in. Well, I'd all of a sudden change the whole conversation. And he goes, well, why would you do that? Don't you agree he was wrong? He says, from what you've told me, now remember the book of Proverbs says, one side sounds right until you hear the other side. Remember that? So for what you told me, everything sounds right. But whether you're right or whether you're wrong, that sanctuary doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to the church. It doesn't belong to me. That's God's sanctuary. And if you touch God's house, I pray he will, I almost said smite you. I said, I pray that God will show you just how big he is and how little you are. He goes, Nobody's ever explained it to me like that before. (laughs) But, you know, I thought about that conversation, and, boy, I have all of that recorded in detail in my journal because it was so funny. I came back to the staff, and they could overhear me talking. We were actually in the Olive Garden. They could over, everybody else could overhear me talking. And so I came back to the staff, and they said, what was that? And I said, you don't want to know. And I left it at that. But here's the point. The Lord began dealing with me and says, you know what? That does belong to me. It's been given to me. It was dedicated to me. But the sanctuary is my people. I dwell in the hearts and the lives of my people. I got to tell you something. That was a revolutionary moment in my life as I realized just how powerful the church is. Without the presence of God, when the glory of the Lord departed in the book of Ezekiel, The temple was conquered and burnt to the ground and its treasures carried off. Without the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart and my heart, we are powerless against the enemy. But when we live and breathe and walk in the Spirit of God, we are invincible. Can we give him a hand of praise for that this morning? We are invincible. So remember what I said about the babies and the teenagers and the children. What I want them to remember is David remembered the presence of God in the say When we come together, we come to worship. It's not a social event. It's a time where we gather in his presence. And then he would go on in verse 3 to say, your unfailing love is better than life itself. Now David is running for his life. And he's telling us something here. If Absalom is successful, if the enemy is successful and he slays me, Lord, your love, I know that though this body perishes, I will wake up in the presence of God. Now, he had the promises of God to stand upon. I believe David knew he would prevail. And what I need to know is, do you know that you will prevail? Do you realize that God has called you to be more than an overcomer? Do you realize that God has called you to be a conqueror? It's why those, and we had a brother from Pakistan here in the first service this morning, and we had a chance to talk, and we're going to get together later this week, and I've ministered in Bangladesh, it used to be a part of Pakistan, and we had some time to talk together, but as we shared together, we talked about a reference I made to saints who were literally giving their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. They expose their necks to the knife that slits their throats because of their love and their faith in Jesus Christ, because they believe the unfailing love of God is better than the life we breathe upon this planet, but they also know like David, they will wake up in the presence of the Lord. But if there's anything I've learned in this life, having faced death several times is this, my life will not be over until I have finished what God has called me to do. And your life will not be over until God has finished what God has called you to do. 
So David goes from this place of, what is everybody thinking about my son? He's betrayed me. Most of the kingdom have stayed behind. I only have this remnant. I left with people cursing me and hating me. What does he say I will do? Look at verse 4 with me. Read it if it's up on the screen. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Some of you watching, it's time to come back to the sanctuary. Some of you watching, it's time to come back and be a part of the body of Christ in gathering. But we have all experienced this this year, didn't we? Or last year during the pandemic, when we couldn't meet together because of how intense it was. We faithfully gathered online, but I got to tell you, it was a challenge to come in here and preach to empty pews and the staff sitting around and sometimes people that were coming in to help, you know. I remember preaching one Sunday morning and there was somebody eating a Big Mac or something in front of me and I could smell the Big Mac the whole time I was preaching and I made a rule, you can't bring food in and eat it in front of me while I'm preaching, you know. You got to enter into the, the service here with me on a Sunday morning. You almost made me backslide this morning. I was hungry. <laughs> But here's the deal. We, we know what it was like not to be able to gather. And in that time, our devotional time at home became more important than ever. So the third place you find the Lord is when you take time daily to lift your hands up and to worship him in prayer. Lifting your hands up is a way of accomplishing spiritual warfare. Do you remember the story of when Moses was praying and Joshua was in this intense battle? And while he was praying and he had his hands lifted up, Joshua was prevailing, but Moses became weary. The leader became weary. And, and as he began to lower his hands in prayer, suddenly the enemy began to prevail against Joshua. And Joshua, and Joshua knew something was wrong. And Aaron, the high priest, and her, they recognized what was going on. So they came alongside of Moses and they held his hands up in prayer. And as Moses prayed with his hands uplifted, Joshua prevailed and the battle was won. There are some things in the spirit that are not going to happen unless we as a congregation agree to pray and to intercede together. It is why that Saturday prayer service is so important to take that hour to join with Becky and I on Facebook and help us as we intercede and pray. The list of requests that come through the church, the list that come to my email or are texted to me, they're always intense and they're always great. And those prayer requests go with me throughout the week, every day of my life, including Sunday, knowing certain people are watching and certain challenges that they're facing. And there's something powerful about our gathering together and saying, for one hour, I'm going to turn off the football game. For one hour, I'm going to turn off the television. For one hour, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray. And then the final place I want you to look at with me this morning is in verse 6. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. And because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. And I cling to you, and your strong right hand holds me securely. I was a young daddy when this first stood out to me. As a matter of fact, I can describe to you where I was sitting. We had a blue sofa at the time. We foolishly had white carpet with two small little boys. <laughs> and I'm sitting on that blue sofa early in the morning, white carpet. And Becky was always so proud of that living room. And I realized then I wanted my house to be a place, not just the church, not just the sanctuary, but I wanted my house to be a place where our children could find God. Years ago, I shared this with you. You may have forgotten it, or you may not even remember it, or you may not even have been a part of the church then. But that morning, I got up, and it was the sun. Had, it was long before coming up, but my oldest son is an early riser like me. And he came in, 
And I was kneeling in front of a wingback chair that we had at the time. And I'm kneeling in front of that wingback chair and I'm praying. And Andrew gets between me and the chair. So if you could imagine, I'm kneeling in front of a chair. He gets right here between me and the chair. And I'm praying. Well, I'm praying about something that's, as I'm going to pray, that I don't mind him hearing me pray about. And then I begin to pray about something that I realize that he doesn't need to hear me pray about. But I don't want him to leave. I want him to, I want him to have these memories of growing up. And so I began to pray in the Spirit. As I prayed in the Spirit, Andrew squirms around and taps me on the mouth and says, no, pray in English, pray in English. And I'll never forget that moment. Pray in English. And I have laughed about that moment. But it was years later. My son's whatever you call the group they were in, suddenly they got trapped in an urban area. And all of a sudden, all of these terrorists were coming up out of the sewer hole covers and snipers from on top of the building in Souter City during that rebellion. And Andrew has his headset on, and he's the top gunner, if you've ever seen, with the saw gun up there. And he's called me... The next day, and he says, Dad, he says, it was unbelievable. He said, we got trapped. People pulled in and blew some stuff up behind us. We couldn't get out, and snipers and people coming up out of the sewer, and they're all shooting. And he said, Dad, he says, we survived. He said, we end up, we, we survived. They, they fled. He says, it was, he said, Dad, there were just all kinds of terrible things happening and I said, son, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful you're okay. I'm, he said, dad, not one person, not one person from our group was injured in that firefight, dad. Not one person was harmed. He said, I said, son, I'm so thankful. But he says, dad, here's what you got to know. He said, I ha-, he said, we're all connected. He said, the whole time, he says, dad, I'm praying in the spirit. It's the way you pray in the spirit. He says, I'm praying in the spirit he said, I'm praying out loud. He said, when it's all over, he says, we're, he said, the guys are thankful. And, and he says, I'm giving God glory for having protected us. And he said, Dad, they call me chaplain. And he goes, they go, they go chaplain. That wasn't Arabic. He's an Arabic speaker. He says, that wasn't Arabic you were speaking in. What were you speaking in? He says, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you were screaming the whole time. He goes, well, I was praying the whole time. He says, no, well, you weren't praying in English. We couldn't understand you. And he said, Dad, that's when he dawned on me. I was praying in the Spirit. The best place for our children to learn about how to pray in intense times is not here, but is with a mom and a dad and a grandfather and a grandmother to take the time to bring them into the presence of God. My home must be a sanctuary as well. My home must be a sanctuary. And so he says, I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. What do you go to bed thinking about? What do you go to bed pondering? I mean, it's not necessary that you read the Bible every night before you go to bed. But there's something for me personally that I benefit greatly out of just reading a few verses from my Bible. Maybe it's a head start on my daily portion that I'm reading. I read several chapters a day for my personal devotions in the morning. Maybe it's just getting a head start there. Maybe it's a topic, or maybe it's something I, I need to reflect upon. It might be Psalm 63. But there in the wilderness, now listen, there in the wilderness, away from home, away from Jerusalem, away from the tabernacle, away from the place that the presence of God was supposed to dwell in the Old Testament, over the Ark of the Covenant, there between a rock and a hard spot, with an enemy behind him, David made a home in the wilderness, and he thought about the Lord, and he began to sing for joy. 
You see, you're not ready to go back into battle until you can leave the presence of the Lord singing for joy. Look at verse 7. I, I just read it to you, but I'm going to wrap it up here. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. Now look, all of my people are farmers. I've grown up around chickens and roosters. For a brief time, we had a chicken and a rooster that was a gift to us that we called Bobby and Hazel. I have never seen a rooster one time try to shelter the biddies. But when the hawk approached or when a threat approached, it was always the hen that gathered the little ones to her side to protect them. You see, the reason moms and dads are so important in a home is that male and female, he created them to represent the image of God in our lives. And our children need godly parents and grandparents to teach them, to love them, so that our children find joy in the shadow of our homes. It doesn't mean they will always do the right thing by you. But you're always there. And David, when his son Absalom was called, he said, deal gently with Absalom. Deal gently with Absalom. And it was a man of treachery that dealt fearsome with Absalom. And our children need to know the difference between dealing with people who are godly and people who are treacherous. And they learn that from these wonderful stories of the Bible and the examples we sing to them. But what about you? You may be going through a difficult trial in your life right now. Sometimes I say to people when they've been through a difficult place, Listen, I just want you to sit on the pew for the next three months or six. Don't worry about ministry. Don't worry about serving. We'll get your place covered. Sometimes people come to us from other churches and they've, they've been hurt or something. I'll say, I just want you to sit here. You, you may want to go back to your church in some time. We, you know, we'd never try to take somebody from another church. You may want to go back to your church in time. Just sit and rest until you begin to sing for joy. And it's been very rare that Anybody has ever left because, you see, when you sit in the presence of God, God will incubate you, God will heal you, and God will restore your joy. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if David could find joy in the wilderness with his son chasing him to try and kill him, his former friends chasing him to try to kill him, his former pastor giving advice on how to kill him, if David could still sing in the wilderness, how much more would the presence of God not dwelling over a tabernacle, but dwelling in our hearts, has God made us more than conquerors through him that loved us? Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to the lies of the wicked one. For David says what I want you to know. All liars will be silenced. Do what the old gospel song says. Write a message to the devil on the bottom of your shoe and just crunch it right in his ugly face. Can you say amen? Would you stand with me this morning and let me pray with you before you go home today. Father, I thank you so much. Lord, you are never far and you are never distant from us. I thank you for the wonderful, wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that our church will always be a place, God, where we recognize that what makes us a church is not this building. But what makes us a church is the presence of God dwelling with each of us. I pray that when we enter into this sanctuary, that, Lord, we will come prayed up, confessed up, and ready to lift up the name of Jesus 
and ready to build one another up as well. Lord, I pray that when we're wounded, that in this place, Lord, that we will find healing and people that will pray with us and lift our hands in prayer so that we might prevail against the powers of darkness. I pray, Jesus, that every one of our homes will be a place of hope and a place of healing and never a place of horror as so many places have been. And I pray finally today, Lord, that every lie that the devil has spoken against any single one of us, God will fall to the ground impotent. For we are the beloved of God. We are the people of God. We are his chosen and his beloved as all, all people who confess the name of Jesus Christ. So this morning we celebrate this in your wonderful and your holy presence. For it's in your name I pray. And with every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you've, you've been hurt in life. And I know everyone in here, but some of you have been hurt, and you know what I'm talking about, how God restores joy. Or maybe you're in our online congregation, and you're watching this morning. I want you to know there's a place of healing for you. Too many times I meet believers that have been wounded and hurt, and they've wandered away from faith, and they've wandered away from the church. God loves the church. You're a part of the church. Come home to Jesus. And if you've never committed your life to him, you will never know the full purpose and meaning of life until, first of all, you turn from your sins to follow Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, what is sin? Sin is a power of evil at work in our lives, and our sins are those things we know that we do that are wrong. I can never condemn anybody because I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I can share with you the good news that Jesus Christ will forgive you and he will change you. And if you're wondering how to do that, let me help you get started. This morning, believe upon the Lord Jesus. Believe that what Jesus did, he did for you. And pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I want that song of joy. I want, Lord, to know your presence in my home, in the city, and in the wilderness, in the country, and in the suburbs. Lord, I want my children to know your voice so that when they face a battle and their lives are on the line, that, Lord, they remember your presence at home and in the sanctuary, and they know how to call out to God. Oh, Lord, I want the freedom that comes from the forgiveness of my sins. So as much as I know how, I confess my faith in Jesus Christ this morning that you died for me at Calvary and you rose again on the third day. And I ask you to come into my heart and into my life. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. If you prayed that prayer, Pastor Corey is going to come and tell you about a gift that we want to give you, bless you, and help you get started with your walk of faith in Christ. Email me or text me at prayer at woodland.church or info at woodland.church and let me know you made that decision for Christ today because I have something I want to send you tomorrow. God bless you. Pastor Corey. Once again, thank you so much for joining with us. And if you did pray that prayer, we have a book that we'd love to give you. If you just go out to the crossing and just say, you know, I prayed that prayer. Can I have that book? We'd be glad to give it to you. And if you're watching online, email us at info at woodlandnotchurch. Let us know you prayed that prayer, and we'd be glad to send it to you as well. This book is going to help you in your next steps and help you understand uh, a little bit more uh, about your commitment now to Christ. And so uh, please let us know, and we want to be praying for you as well. Also, as you get ready to go, don't forget to give today. You can give online. You can text to give. And if you have offering in your hands today, we'll have an usher with a basket uh, that you can place it in along with those communication cards. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.